Uh, welcome to yet another reading of America Negro Slave Revolts, Chapter 10, Section 1. Thank you again for joining this stream, this broadcast, this wonderful reading. Um, as y'all know, we are winding down to the end of this book shortly. I want people to go back from the start point of this um, reading from chapter one till now to get a brief understanding and, you know, a summary of what led up to this um, conclusion of this book. And like I said, the purpose of this book is to dispel the myth that American slaves or the idiots man and woman here in America did not just sit down and took the abuse, um, took the rape, the torture, you know, you name it, all types of heinous crimes no human being should go through. And then miraculously, the people that put them in this oppression, which are the European, the, the Caucasoids, you know, or pilgrims, or wherever you want to label them, it will dispel the myth that they decide after s centuries of abuse, torture, you know, all this stuff, that they decide to say, you know, we're just going to let you go free and, you know, all is forgiven. That is sadly not the truth. Your ancestors, not only, not only the Caribbean that fought, bled, and died, but you also have fought, bled, and died, and took the serious price to get your actual liberation from physical oppression. And that's the purpose of this book. To really go through the deep articles, what really went on from the 1600s up to the late 1800s. You know, and I think this is more of the educational piece to really give clarity for not only adults that's, I would say, roughly 20, 20 to 40 years old, but to people that are, I would say, 13 up on the average, age-wise. Um, normally, I think boys and girls could understand this history as well. But like I said, this is not being taught into the so-called school systems in um, here, the Western world we call America. So, um, like always, you know, enjoy this reading. Um, and after every stream, I would like to get feedback. I would like your comments to what you feel about the reading so far. Um, how it made you feel? Certain things you didn't understand, learn. And also, I would advise get it the book on YouTube. I mean, not on YouTube. Um, on Amazon or any other publication, you should buy the book personally and have it in your library and read to not only yourself for better clarity, but for your children to learn. Because it's going to come to a point that no one's going to teach your history. That's going to be your responsibility as a parent, whether you're a woman raising your children or you're a man raising your children. At the end of the day, your choice to how your children view themselves in history is solely up to you. So, at the end of the day, they're not responsible to teach your children actual facts and history. No, and you should not expect that. You know, because how can I continue my... What's the best word to say? Of me feeding on you when you don't know yourself. Or to keep sucking your blood if you don't know yourself. Is very counteractive. So, at the end of the day, you know, it is solely your responsibility. It is not other groups or ethnic groups' responsibility to teach your actual history. And you got to understand the Negro man, Negro woman, or what we call the African man, African woman, wherever you want to label black people, their history is world history, they are part of history. And to know your place in history, 
you have to understand where you are globally back then because history is being referenced through a bigger lens and I think people should find the right lens to put on to see through the nonsense so enough of that chapter 10 section 1 this is 1810 through 1819 that's a period of almost a decade Rebellious activity amongst the slaves entered a more intense phase beginning in 1810 and lasting for six years, after which recur, as usual, a short lips of relative quantitative economic depression, some evidence of which has been presented was characterized of most of the period for the South, largely induced by soil exhaustion, the embargo and non-intercourse acts, and the war itself, and the last causing considerable devastation in eastern Maryland and Virginia. This organizing and the labor force, and rather effectively checking exportations while rising the price of imports articles to high levels. Other events of a military nature affected by the slave population during the period there were revolts in East and West Florida and filibusters against Texas extended from 1810 to 1812. These brought discoration and excitement or dislocation and to many areas of the South together with widely spread revolutionary propagandas so that appeals were made for men to join in the fight against the avoid enemies of Republican liberties or to help in enabling and the conditions of an oppressed and subjugated people. In March 1810, the discovery of two communications on a road to Halifax County, North Carolina, was reported. One was from a slave in Greece County, Georgia, to another slave, Cornell Locus of Martin County, North Carolina, another likewise to the from slaves have been sent from Tennessee and was intended for Brunswick County, Virginia. The content of both letters were de declared to be similar and one that to Cornell Locus may be quite in full. Or quote it in full. Dear Sir, I received your letter to the 14th of June, 1809. With great freedom and joy to hear and understand what great proceedings you have made and the resolutions you have in proceeding on a business as we have undertook and hope you will still continue in the same mind. We have spread the sense nearly over the continent in our part of the country and have the day when we are to fall to work and you must be sure not to fail on that day. And that is of the 22nd of April to begin about midnight and do the work at home first and then take the arms of them you say first and that will strengthen us more in arms for freedom and we want and will have for we have served this cruel land long enough and he and the secret conveying your nose your noose as possible and be sure to send it by some 
careful hand, and if happens to be discovered, fail not in the day, for we are full abating to conquer by any means. Sir, I am your Captain James, living in the state of Jargi in Green County, so no more as present by remaining your sinister friend and cap captain until death. And the letter, or this letter, were given to General Thomas Blunt, a North Carolina congressman, and he believed them genuinely. Ford then to the governor, Milditch of Georgia. This probably explains, at least in part, the passage in the letter message to the legislator referring to information he had received. From a source so respectfully as to admit but little doubt of the existence of a plan of an insurrection being formed amongst our demonstrated and particularly in Greece County. The final piece of information seems on this episode is contained in the letter written by a resident of Augusta, Georgia to a friend in Salem, Massachusetts dated April 9th, 1810. And according to this, the letter from Captain James is but a small part of the evidence of a disposition of blacks in this part of the country. The most vigorous measures are taken to defeat their infernal design. May God preserve is from the fate of St. Domingo. The papers here will, for obvious reasons, observe a total silence on this business. And the nail being near close, I can say no more on the subject at present. Richard W. Broad of Smithfield, Virginia, wrote on May 30th, 1810, to Governor John Tyler concerning evidence of trouble in his neighborhood. This lengthy letter read in parts. An insurrection of the blacks on the Saturday night proceedings with Sunday is much feared. As to myself, I am not satisfied that their plans are perfectly mature, but that such a scheme has been in competition or compilation is being all doubt. Our unremitted vigilance may probably frustrate their design in this neighborhood, but unless similar exertions are generally used, the consequence may be extremely fatal. A report that such an attempt would be made about Whit Sunday, or Whit Sundays, in North Carolina, have been very prevalent here are for eight or ten days. One Negro boy, after receiving twenty lashes, states that the operations were to commerce in Carolinas, that they were to fight with clubs, spikes, axe, if necessary. They and the Carolina Negroes would immediately come on here to help the Virginia Negroes. Mr. Broy felt the slave preacher use their religious meetings as veils for revolutionary schemes. And reference particularly to a general pet Peter of Isis of White who had been in communications with slaves of North Carolina. In their message, the slaves referred to the planned revolt as an earthquake and one Virginia slave had been heard to say that there would be an earthquake here as well as in North Carolina. On the same night that he was entitled to this freedom and he would be damned if he did not have it in it a fortnight, Mr. Broy concluded by remarking, we have taken up many of these followers and expect to go on in the same way. This course may possibly avert the dreadful calamities with which we are threatened. 
for the thought it purples that we have broken the chains by which they were linked. Now, I think this is talking about when they tried to stop some revolts, so they had to break certain ties in regards, I think, gathering or their schemes of revolts. But that's my opinion. Let's continue. In June, a slave named Sam, the property of John G. Pinner of Nesmond County, was convicted by an ISIS of right court of conspiracy to rebel. A free Negro, Sam Scott, was an important witness against him. Do you hear that? Now, mind you, a lot of people didn't think that there were some free Negroes. But these same free Negroes don't want the Negroes that's under oppression or changed to the masses to sit there playing a rebellion against masters. Oh, no, you can't have that. Can't have that. You got you got to stay in your place. So even during them times, the people that were quote unquote free still had to play the game to enjoy the delicacies of life while you were oppressed. So not every free nigger was a nigger to the best interest of the black people of that time that was still under shackle slavery. Okay. An important witness against him declaring that in May, while in his master's county, the said prisoner asked the witness if he knew anything of the black people rising to which the witness answered he did not, so he said. Which the prisoner said he did, and he himself was one of the men. At the same time, Lieutenant Connor Sharp report troubles in Norfolk while some what later that month three slaves, two women and a man were accused of arson activities in Culpert or Culpepper. One of the women received 15 lashes or 15 lashes and the man Gasgrown was hanged and the father or actually the later sentence was carried out at the written request addressed to the governor of the five magistrates who condemned him for in the present situation of our slaves. We are strongly impressed with the opinions that his being either repressive or sold would have an injurious effect on the minds of the neighboring slaves. A similar request came from many citizens of Isis of Right in connection with Sam, for it was again held that the present situation of the section of county or the country requires that examples by the strict execution of law in South cases or such cases are absolutely necessary for the safety of the society. In this case, however, the governor's judgment did not coincide with the of his petitioners. And on July 9th, the state sold Sam for $300 together with five other slaves condemning for various reasons. To William Towles, slave trader of Edgefield, South Carolina. At the end of November 1810, a dangerous conspiracy among the Negroes was discovered in Lexington, Kentucky. A great many Negroes were put in jail, but what become of them is not known. Further indications of trouble is given by the fact that Kennedy or Kentucky passed a law in January 1811 making conspiracy among slaves a crime punishable by death. And we gotta highlight that, because that's a very important thing. And to keep a note why that's important. Because, as y'all know, conspiracy can, can lead to many things. It could lead to not only back then revolt, but other things that will help or conspire others to think some schemes going on for something bigger. 
And during that day, as a slave, they didn't take it too much seriously where they had to put some in the books to say you had to be killed for just conspiring to do something. No, it was different during the times. Only it started to really take really effect in one state in Kentucky, and that was during the early 1800s. And the reason why, I think why they, they had to put this a law into that where it's punishable by death is because there's too many, I guess, Negroes causing master money for not only committing arson, but also killing the master. So obviously, you know, it came to a point where they had to now step and put things, document by law, to really start set president to any slave that does this or is conspired to do something against his master will be punished by death. So, let's continue. There is evidence in the form of an anonymous letter dating merely January 1811 and sent by J.B. to General T.R. that white men were attempting to incite slave rebellions in Virginia, J.B. seemed to have had trouble in enlisting as many slaves as he wished, and from the letter itself, one is moved to declare that the slaves were screwed and distrusting him. He had offered to give $25 to each rebellion once Richmond had fallen and had seceded, so he wrote in Getting Under Our Banner, 100 or they're about who is determining to fight for us. Keep everything silent till that fatal night, which will slowly or which will show to the world that slavery will no longer exist in Virginia. The plan you laid down was good. You say you have 60 under your arm with guns, siding, blades, etc. And I have... 20 arms with muskets and the rest with old swords, clubs. The first move was to fire Richmond and then attack. I will divide my men into four divisions. I will command 25 Peter and Bear, the second Bob, and the third of Henry the Fourth. You lay off your men, conduct everything with secrecy. And we trust in God. If we succeed, we will be very rich. We are molding balls every night. I am JB and B. I have a small keg of powder. Nothing further concerns this plot is known exception. That Milton's officers were notified and ordered to be on the alert. During the afternoon of January 9th, 1811, the people of New Orleans were thrown into the utmost dismay and confusion on discovering wagons and carts staggling into the city, filled with people whose face wore the mask of consternation and who told of having just escaped from a mixture representation of the horrors of San Domingo. They had fled from a revolt of slaves numbering about four or five hundred of St. Charles of St. John's the Baptist Parish, about 25 miles away from the city. These slaves, one of whom leader Charles Desloids, was described as a free mulatto, from St. Domingo, rose in the evening of January 8th, starting at the plantation of a mayor, Adrian. What's up? There were originally arms with came knives, axes, and clubs. After killing Andre, son, and wandering the mayor, they took possession of a few guns, drums, and some sort of flags and started marching from plantation to plantation. Slaves everywhere joined them. They killed at least one other white man and destroyed a few plantations. Major Audrey, according to his own statement, organized about eight well-armed planters and on the 9th of January attacked the slaves. 
of whom we made great slaughter. Many, however, escaped this first attack and continued their depredation. Audrey ordered several strong detachments to pursue them through the woods, and he wrote on January 11th, At every moment, our men bring in or kill them. Meanwhile, in New Orleans, Governor Clamborn had a January 9th appointment seven aside for himself call out the militant and forbid male Negroes from going at large Brigadier Generals Wade Hampton immediately left that city which four hundred militants or militants and sixty United States Army men for the scene of action. Major Milton left Baton Rouge at about the same time with 200 additional soldiers. These forces varied early on the morning of the 10th attack. The rebellious slave and decimate them or decimate them. 60, um, 66 were killed or executed on the spot. 16 were captured and sent to New Orleans, and 17 were reported as missing and were supposed generally to be dead in the woods, as many bodies have been seen by the patrols. All these tried in the city were executed, at least one a leader named Gilbert by a firing squad, and their head were strung aloft at intervals from New Orleans to Audrey Plantation. Hampton report on January the 11th, the Milton have been posted in the neighborhood to aid various companies of the citizen that are scorching in the country in every direction. At the same time, a company of light artillery, artillery actually, that means weapon, and one of the dragons were sent up in the river to suppress disturbance that may have taken place higher up. Governor Calborn, written January 19th, said he was happy to find so few slaves are now in the woods. I hope this dreadful insurrection is at an end, and I pray God I or we may never see another. Precisely what else occurs cannot be said, but this paragraph from a Louisiana paper is suggestive with, or we are sorry to learn that a ferocious sagmary disposition marked the character of some of the inhabitants, civilized man ought to be remembered. Well, his standings and never let himself sink down to a level with a savage or have our summary enough and let them govern. In March 1811 occurred again a type of event that was never long absent in the antebellum south. An armed encounter between outlaw fugitives, slaves, and those who proposed it was to retrieve or annihilate them. At this time, a runaway community in Cabras County, North Carolina, whose inhabitants had bid defiance to any force whoever and were resolved to stand their ground, was set up or set upon by armed men and in the ensuing struggles it was reported that two Negro men were killed one wounded and two nigger women captured. The area in Orleans territory, known as the German coast, which had been so severely disturbed in January of 1811, was again uneasy in December of the same year. Governor Claiborne wrote to Mayor McRae, the commander of the federal troops in the area of the 11th of December, direct him to exercise caution and dispatch arms to the zones of trouble. 
since he had heard that the Negroes in the country or the county of German coast had again evidenced a disposition to raise an insurrection and that this spirit was supposed also to exist among the Negroes in New Orleans. Two days later, he told the Secretary of the Navy, Paul Hamilton, we are again disturbed by the apprehension of an insurrection among the Negroes. I believe they are myself to be unfounded, but measured uh, precautions are nevertheless expected. And these have been directed. There was this affection in Kentucky in 1812. In January, several incendiary fires occur in Lexington and competitively believe them to be the work of slaves intent upon destroying the town. Several were arrested and three were convicted, but only one, a Negro named Jack, seemed actually to have been executed. A fugitive from Kentucky declared years later that his own master had been captain of a reserve corps of men. Over 45 years of age, organized after the outbreak of the war of 1812. The, to aid in slave police duties and that at that time there were many colored people joined in a conspiracy to get their freedom and wore as a mark a plaintiff in their hair over the left eye or plant or left hair over the left eye that this was discovered many were whipped and had the plaintiff cut off a plateau cut off the conspiracy extended over 300 miles from Mansville to Henderson. Two justices of the peace for Montgomery County, Virginia, Henry Edmondson, and John Floyd, the later was to be governor and the secretary of war, present in the council on April 10, 1812. With the interesting confessions of a slave, Tom, who has killed his master, John Smith, and had fled. Tom said that he himself knew of 30 or 40 slave anxiety to rebel and that playing for this under the hardship or the, actually the leadership of a slave named Goomer of Rockham County, North Carolina, were being formed. These slaves said they were not made to work for white people, but they and the white people made to work for themselves and that they, the Negroes, would have it. So Tom informed a slave woman of this plan and she said they could not rise too soon for her as she had rather be in hell than where she was. Let me pause right there. And to make a side note, I don't know if I didn't read that again for y'all because sometimes reading the first time you might miss little clues. Let's hear this again. These slaves said they that they were not made to work for white people, but they, the white people, made to work for themselves, and that they, the Negroes, would have it so. In that little the section of the paragraph, it shows the frustration of the ancestors, the ADOS ancestors, the American Negro. How they come to a point back then, even way back then, that they were not they were meant to not only be their own superior in their own boss, but they don't want to work for others, especially the European of that time. Now, it's very fitting to come across that part that, you know, when you hear the stories for the last couple years, 
even from people that are Negroes or what they said, Black Americans, how they come across, you know, conventions and talk amongst not only Black people but non-Black people. They up here saying that your ancestors were refugees and they were what they call what's the word? I'm trying to remember the word. I don't know if y'all know it. They were um somewhat uh what's the word for uh, I'm trying to remember uh, it's not clicking to me. Um it's not indentured service, but they were they were like um people that came to the country as citizens and they came here in their free will. Now I'm not sure what type of BS a lot of these so called blacks that will put that message out there and you know who I'm talking about. Some that are in politics come across and talk to other non blacks telling say that black people were just other um people that came here willing to find new life. And obviously the history shows otherwise. But like I said, when you get your history from other races, you're not getting the real truth. Especially when you hear from their own people, because it's always a scheme to keep perpetuating that you were you you not only accepted it, but only way you get something and got out of your oppression, they had to reward and give not not give you, but they would have to tell you say uh, that you are free and we got tired of oppressing. That's not how the world works. That's not how history says it or displays it. But let me continue anyway. Floyd and Edmondson added that this postscript and it states <clears throat> since the above discoveries of the underresigned would further represent to years heard bodies that from the most respectable information of a spirit of rebellion is very obvious in this country and is place where the greatest humility and obedience had hetero or hetero been observed it is pertinent to note and this may have been more than coincidence that the Wrigley North Carolina registers of June the 6th, 1812, declared that a runaway slave recently apprehended has said all should be free and that he saw no reason why the sweat of his bro should be expedited in supporting the exaggerations of any man. Notice have already been taken of the serious situation in Mississippi Territory in the summer of 1812, and Governor David Holmes' lengthy letter to Jerry Wickelson on July 22nd, in which occurs the sentence, scarcely a day passed without my receiving some information relative to the design of these people to insurrection. A piece of evidence of a more specific nature appeared in a letter the governor wrote the next day to a planter named David Pinnell. I received your letter of this instant not found by your servant, and thank you for the attention you have shown to the subject to which it relates. A Negro of Mr. Madden is now in jail upon suspicion of being concerned in a plan of insurrection. On tomorrow, an examination of several slaves from Second Creek upon similar chain charges will be had before Judge Simpson. I will therefore thank you to send to this place on tomorrow. The slaves who had the information you have communicated and also the Negro belonging to Mr. Foote, I have no doubt his master will cheerfully assist in the development of this nefarious scheme, or nefarious scheme. If you cannot have the servants sent here tomorrow, be pleased to forward to me the names of the witness and of those who may be implicated 
in order to legally process may issue to apprehend them. A conspiracy involving slaves, free Negroes, and a few white men in New Orleans and the surrounding regions was betrayed in the summer of 1812 by Louis Ball. One of the slaves approached by the plotter on the day Ball talked August 18th. The militants were ordered out, which has completely frustrated their intentions. Some white men who were at, at their heads are in prison. However, a strong guard of the militants are still, of August 25th, ordered out every night. One of these white men, Joseph Woods, was executed in the afternoon of September 13th, at which time all the militants of the city were under arms. Strong patrols were detailed for the night. It is clear that another of the whites implicated in this plot was named McCarty and that he was jailed. But what become of Mr. McCarty or of the Negroes involved is not known. The year was 1813 and 1814 were troublesome ones in addition to the instance of alarms of indication of unrest in the District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, and Louisiana, to which reference has previously been made. Other similar occurrence may be noted. Thus, on March 30th, 1813, the governor of Virginia heard from a Mr. Nathaniel Burnwell of Glossinker County that we are threatened with an insurrection of our Negroes. Ten have been apprehended and are in jail for examination. Mr. Spencer George told the same officials on April 9th of an alarm in Lanchester, the militants was ordered out and three Negroes have been committed for conspiracy and are waiting for trial. Four days later, Mr. Wardwell wrote from Richmond to St. George Tucker, There are three slaves now under sentence of death in the jails of Winsburg. Williamsburg, James City County, condemns on a charge of conspiracy and an insurrection and to be executed on the 23rd instant. In July and in September, like troubles disturbed Norfolk and Richmond. Virginia was rocked early in 1816 by an indigenous John Brown, one George Boxley. In appearance, he was anything but like Brown. But in ideas, he seems to have been well knighted identically. Boxley was between 30 and 40 years of age, 6 feet 1 or 2 inches tall, with a thin vascular of a swollen complexion or a sallow complexion, thin makes his hair light or yellowish. This is the top of his head and tent behind or tied behind. He stooped a little in his shoulder. His large whisk whiskers, blue or gray eyes, pretend to be very religious, is found of take of talking and speaking quick. Boxley has several times openly declared that the distinct this, um distinction between the rich and the poor was too great, that office were given rather to wealth than to merit, and seemed to be an advocate for a more leveling system of government. For many years he had avoided his desperation or disproportion or disappropriation of the slavery of the Negro and wished they were free. It was suggested that his failure to be elected to the state legislature and to advance beyond the post of insigning 
in the war of 1812 may have embedded to him. His economic status was not high and appeared to have fallen preceptually between 1815 and 1816. Late in 1815, George Boxley decided to attempt to free the slaves and form a conspiracy in Spotsylvania, Louisiana, and Orange Counties. A few of the plotters obtained guns and other swords and clubs. The rebellion were to meet during harvest time at Boxley House to bring horse and what weapon they could attack Frederick Brestrick first. Or Frederick Burrs the first. And then push onto Richmond. And we'll stop right there. And we conclude only the first section of chapter 10. And for this little short summary that I could give up so far. More plots. More conspiracy. And more of the slaves intention and taking action to execute their plans in regards to the oppression they had with their slave masters. And the thing that you have to understand is that nothing was easy during the times if you were a slave. You had to sit there, plot and plan to really achieve and to accomplish the goal. And during that time, a lot of the slaves um, knew the enemy. They knew they didn't want to be slaves no more. This frustration was boiling between slave and slave master for a couple, a uh, few hundred years. And only thing what you see that the slave master or the people of that sound, that town or the county had to do was they had to be tight and alert with just the thought of propaganda or the the ambulance or just the whistle of somebody's going to revolt and cause us what we call insurrection. It's even like today, if y'all notice, how propaganda is the first, the first rule of war. Rule of war. Before you have a physical battle, you always have to place in the mind something's going to happen. To put what we call fear to the people. And once the fear manifests, then the action falls suit. And during that time, there was a lot of propaganda going on um, during the 1800s. And obviously, certain cities, certain counties, took not only arm and force against the slaves that are planned to revolt against them, but they had to put things legislative or laws to even further protect them if any of these outbreaks are a reality. That what we call policy for those who don't know. So that's my only conclusion on that first section of chapter 10. Um, thank y'all for listening. Um, like always, if you have any questions, and I'm sure if anybody has questions now, let's see. No is watching um like always go back to the recording of this and I, I advise everybody since we're almost close to the end of this go back to all the previous broadcasts of american negro slave votes um you get a more f full picture of the history of america when it comes to so-called slavery no it's not, but it's actually you get, you get a good sense of what slavery was not only what was conducted, but how the slave handled oppression. Um, this is more of an educational piece for those who are not familiar of the plight of black people in America. Yes, I know. I, I, thank you, um, Mr. Um, Bexton. Um, 
like I said, um, I like to hear from y'all. So please comment, subscribe, and like this video like always. Um, and, you know, be on lookout for the next um, section, section two of chapter 10. Thank you for listening. Good night now.